A shock outright win for the Conservatives, the resignations of three party leaders, an SNP landslide. It's been quite an election. David Cameron walked into number 10 with a majority, knowing he's Prime Minister of a politically transformed United Kingdom. We will govern as a party of one nation, one United Kingdom. It's been a night and a day of extraordinary drama, the voters delivering a blow to some of the biggest names in politics. Ed Miliband, Nick Clegg and UKIP's Nigel Farage all resigned as party leaders within an hour of each other. I take absolute and total responsibility for the result and our defeat at this election. I'm so sorry for all of those colleagues who lost their seats. The SNP swept Labour out of Scotland. They won all but three of 59 seats. The Scottish lion has roared this morning across the country. And we've travelled from Scotland to London, getting voters' reactions to the changed political landscape. It's the first time I've actually smiled after a general election. And I just can't understand where all the, the pundits have been who are saying Labour are going to do well and these are going to do well. And I just don't know where it's all come from. Tonight on BBC London, going, going, gone, the Liberal Democrats are all but wiped out in the capital. But Labour bucks its disastrous national trend and gains seven seats in London. Good evening and welcome to the BBC's News at Six here in Downing Street. One of the most unpredictable elections in generations has come up with the most unexpected of results. David Cameron walked back into number 10 this afternoon at the head of a Tory party that had been swept back to power with a majority. Success too for the SNP. They now dominate the political map of Scotland. Equally dramatic, three other party leaders fell like dominoes, resigning within an hour of each other. Ed Miliband, Nick Clegg and Nigel Farage, who failed to win his seat. So here are the final results. The Conservatives have 331 seats and a 37% share of the vote. Labour have 232 and the SNP 56 of the 59 available seats in Scotland. The Liberal Democrats in coalition government, of course, last time round, were decimated. They lost 49 seats, leaving them with just eight. Turnout was 66%. Our deputy political editor, James Landell, has our first report tonight on an extraordinary Conservative victory. They're scenes we were told not to expect for weeks. A short journey that would be taken only after days of negotiations. But instead, David Cameron and his wife travelled to Buckingham Palace today to tell the Queen that he would, after all, be staying on as her Prime Minister. But unlike five years ago, he returned to Downing Street not as the leader of a coalition, but the master of his own house. I've just been to see Her Majesty the Queen and I will now form a majority Conservative government. And after an election that strained the ties that bind Scotland and England, the Prime Minister promised to govern as a party of one nation, one United Kingdom. I have always believed in governing with respect. That's why in the last Parliament we devolved power to Scotland and Wales and gave the people of Scotland a referendum on whether to stay inside the United Kingdom. In this Parliament I will stay true to my word and implement as fast as I can the devolution that all parties agreed for Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. His defeated opponent also went on a journey, also with his wife, but they went to Labour headquarters to thank his party for the hard work that in the end had not paid off. The responsibility, Ed Miliband said, was his alone. And now it's time for someone else to take forward the leadership of this party. So I'm tendering my resignation. It was not the speech they'd wanted to hear, it was not the speech he had wanted to give. I am truly sorry I did not succeed. I've done my best for nearly five years. Now you need to show your responsibility. Your responsibility, not simply to mourn our defeat, but to pick yourself up and continue the fight. We've come back before and this party will come back again. But will his party come back again too? 
Nick Clegg's Lib Dems suffered devastating losses, with just eight MPs remaining in Parliament. And... For that, of course, I must take responsibility, and therefore I announce that I will be resigning as leader of the Liberal Democrats. History, he said, would judge the Lib Dems more kindly than the voters, who'd inflicted what he called a crushing and unkind blow on the party. But that was little comfort for his supporters. Fear and grievance have won. Liberalism has lost. But it is more precious than ever. And we must keep fighting for it. This is a very dark hour for our party. But we cannot and will not allow decent liberal values to be extinguished overnight. Our party will come back. Our party will win again. The party that won last year's European elections today won millions of votes and came second in many seats in the north of England. But tonight, UKIP has just one MP, and it's not him. Nigel Farage had promised to resign if he didn't win Thanet South, so... But I'm a man of my word. I don't break my word. So I should be writing uh, to the UK uh, UKIP national executive in a few minutes, uh, saying that I am standing down, standing down as leader of UKIP. Although, inevitably, he didn't rule out standing again one day. The night had begun with a shock. Here it is, 10 o'clock, and we are saying the Conservatives are the largest party. Few this could believe poll. it. If this exit poll is right, Andrew, I will publicly eat my hat on your programme. But as the night wore on, it became clear the exit poll was right. The Conservatives were taking seats from the Lib Dems and holding off Labour, the first party of government to increase its seats and votes for years. No wonder the Chancellor was smiling. The Tories succeeded in part because Labour did not, failing to make gains in key marginal seats across England and elsewhere even losing seats, including that held by the Shadow Chancellor. Any personal um, disappointment I have uh, this result is as nothing compared to the sense of sorrow I have at um, the result that Labour has achieved across the United Kingdom. But Labour's worst losses were in Scotland, where the party was all but wiped out, with just one MP now representing what was once Labour's heartland. So out went the party leader in Scotland, Jim Murphy, and the Shadow Foreign Secretary, Douglas Alexander. And it was her party that had caused all the damage. The Scottish National Party almost swept the board, winning 56 MPs in an unstoppable landslide. The Scottish lion has roared this morning across the country. The Nationalists took seats not just from Labour, but also the Lib Dems, who suffered huge losses south of the border, a party punished for joining the coalition and not living up to all its promises. A party that lost most of its big names. Vince Cable, Danny Alexander, Simon Hughes and Charles Kennedy, all ousted from Parliament. It was a day that defied the polls and surprised the media. A day that transformed the political okay. map of Britain. So after all the talk of hung parliaments and coalitions and deals, tonight, once again, we have a government run by one party. And for the first time, David Cameron is in Downing Street with a real mandate to do what he wants. The only question is how much he's constrained by the smallness of his majority. For now, Ed Miliband and Nick Clegg had one last duty, to lay a wreath at the Cenotaph to mark VE Day. They had hoped to be in government, but it was not to be, for they lost, and David Cameron won what he called the sweetest victory of all. James Land, LBC News, Westminster. Well, as David Cameron settles into another few years in the building behind me, how did the Conservatives manage to secure their unexpected majority? And what lies ahead now for a Conservative government? Carol Walker reports on the Conservative strategy. He's defied the polls and all the expectations. At his party headquarters early this morning, David Cameron thanked staff for helping to deliver the Conservative majority government even he never quite believed he could achieve. The real reason to be proud, the real reason to be excited, is we are going to get the opportunity to serve our country again. So how did he do it? This is Bath, a seat held by the Liberal Democrats for 23 years, one of a swathe of constituencies across the South West, seized by the Conservatives from their former coalition partners. 
probably because of the coalition that they did with the Conservative Party. I think that let a lot of uh, Lib Dem voters down. I think it's for the promises they didn't keep when they came into the coalition, where they didn't, the tuition fees, etc. How are you? Oh, you got your hands full. <laughs> the Tory campaign focused on convincing voters the election was a choice between David Cameron and Ed Miliband as Prime Minister, and warnings that Labour reliant on the SNP would jeopardise the economic recovery. David Cameron rolled up his sleeves and injected some raw passion into a campaign in danger of appearing lacklustre and defensive. Taking a risk, having a punt, having a go, that pumps me up, and it's what is changing our country. He was helped by the slump in support for the Lib Dems. The two things that have caught us all out are just how the Tories have just taken pretty well every Lib Dem seat where they came second, and also there's been practically no net gains by Labour from the Conservatives. It's the result of a strategy shaped by Linton Crosby, the veteran Australian campaign director, and Jim Messina, a former aide to Barack Obama, to focus on the economy and the offer of more jobs and lower taxes. But it won't be easy for him to deliver on those promises. He'll need to win votes in the Commons with the narrowest of majorities over his rivals and he'll be reliant on the loyalty of his own MPs. He's already met this man, who represents the views of many Tory MPs. I think it's right for members of Parliament, member, members of Parliament to push uh, agendas, to uh, try to drive forward the things that we believe in, but ultimately we have to uh, work together if we're going to achieve anything. The Prime Minister faces huge constitutional challenges over Scotland and Europe, the Queen's speech setting out his programme for government will tell us much about how he will govern the country. Carol Walker, BBC News, Westminster. So, a result that no one predicted and one that the polls completely misjudged. An inquiry has now been launched into how they got it so wrong. I'm joined by our political editor now, Nick Robinson. Nick, this is not the story we expected to be standing here discussing this evening, is it? You're absolutely right, Fiona. No pollster, no pundit, no, crucially, political leader saw this coming. Not even David Cameron himself, who's now back in number 10. Why? Look, governing parties don't win more seats, do they? Parties that have made substantial spending cuts and are promising, well, they don't win more seats, do they? Well, until they did today, achieving what looked like mission impossible, a Tory majority. Now, how did they do it? In part, because they crushed their coalition partners. If the Lib Dem Parliamentary Party walk down this street now, they could hail two London cabs, there'd still be two seats to spare. How else did they do it? Well, Nigel Farage gained those millions of votes, but he didn't even get a seat for himself. And, of course, the SNP tidal wave that swept away the Labour Party in Scotland. But, and this is crucial and shouldn't be forgotten, Ed Miliband's Labour Party did worse than Gordon Brown five years ago, even after the worst financial crash in our living memories. And that means that the man Ed Bowles, who thought he'd be moving in there, Douglas Alexander, who thought he'd be moving into the building opposite us, the Foreign Office, they're now on the unemployment register. So this is undoubtedly David Cameron's personal triumph, but is, of course, also Nicola Sturgeon's. So the only remaining question for the next five years, can they ever live together? Can Scotland live with the rest of the UK? Or will David Cameron become the last ever Prime Minister of the UK and Nicola Sturgeon the first ever leader of an independent Scotland. Nick Robinson, thank you very much. Well, as Nick was saying, it was a remarkable night in Scotland where the SNP swept Labour aside, taking 56 out of 59 seats. The SNP leader, Nicola Sturgeon, described the result as an overwhelming vote for change. Well, Gavin Esler is in Glasgow for us now. Gavin, this marks a dramatic new chapter for politics in Scotland. It certainly does, Fiona. Welcome to Glasgow. And behind me, what used to be called Red Clydeside, a rock-solid Labour stronghold. Now, like almost all of Scotland, SNP yellow. The sheer scale of the SNP's rise and its rivals' collapse across Scotland is still sinking in, though tonight some people are questioning how much the party's MPs will actually be able to deliver up against the Conservative majority, of course, at Westminster. Our Scotland correspondent James Cook sent this report on the SNP's extraordinary landslide. <laughs> Waiting to make history. <laughs> it's 20 past two in the morning and the Scottish National Party has just pulled off a stunning coup. <laughs> 
The Nationalists have unseated the Shadow Foreign Secretary, Douglas Alexander. They can't quite believe it, but in seat after seat across Scotland, it's the same story. It's historic. You know, the political firmament, the tectonic plates of Scottish politics have shifted tonight. What we're seeing is a historic watershed. For the new MP for Paisley, it's a night of emotion and pride. At 20 years old, Mary Black is the youngest member of Parliament since the 19th century. People are switched on. The political spin doesn't work anymore. They're looking for high quality arguments and they're looking for genuine representation and genuine change. So um, Clydeside's not red anymore? No, Glasgow, uh, much of Scotland, has been painted yellow overnight. I mean, True, just been... but Britain as a whole has turned blue and Nicola Sturgeon's 56 MPs will be sitting on the opposition benches. We put ending austerity at the top of our agenda when we published our manifesto. That's our number one priority. The government's got to listen to what has happened in Scotland. There's been an overwhelming vote against continued austerity. For Labour, this is simply a calamity. One MP in Scotland. The party lost seats with majorities of more than 20,000 breaking British political records. Even the leader couldn't cling on. Are you resigning? And given that you've just presided over the most catastrophic performance your party has ever put in in Scotland, if you're not, why are you not? I said last night at the election count, in what is now my former constituency, um, that the fight back begins and I'm determined to still be part of that fight back. For half a century and more, the Labour movement has towered above Scottish politics. Now it lies in ruins. What on earth can Jim Murphy do to rebuild it? <laughs> the SNP boss insists this election was not about independence, but plenty of her supporters want it back on the agenda. And politically, Scotland does now look like a very different country. James Cook, BBC News, Glasgow. Well, our Scotland political editor, Brian Taylor, is with me here now. Brian, what do you think the SNP can actually achieve with their 56 MPs? These are remarkable elections. This election, this Westminster election, has uh, left Scotland and England as two nations divided by a common parliament. As, as things stand, you can envisage the, the Conservative backbenchers growling at the SNP, how dare you come down here and purport to intervene in matters that are solely confined to England. You have the SNP who will respond, how dare you as the Conservative government purport to govern Scotland, where you have but a single MP and, and we... The, the SNP can demand change for Scotland. Of course, they cannot deliver it on themselves. The Conservatives have an overall majority in the House. Nonetheless, one hears from the tone of... The common sense that I think it is unlikely he will be over assertive on this question because if he is then it risks the entire union for which his party of course stands there the Conservative and Unionist Party I think you'll perhaps uh, remember a quote delivered uh, in an earlier uh, episode in which it was said better uh, an imperfect union than a perfect divorce uh, the one who said that was David Cameron soon after taking over as leader of the Conservative Party. Brian thanks as always well Tonight, voters are still coming to terms with this new political landscape. Here in Scotland, there will be, of course, far-reaching consequences. And across the UK, millions of voters are asking what it means. A moment more from Downing Street. First, our correspondent John Kay has been gauging the mood among voters travelling from Edinburgh to London. Edinburgh, 6 a.m., taking in the news on the way to work very ecstatic about the results in Scotland. It's the first time I've actually smiled after a general election. Got the Tories, Labour away, independence next. But you got the Tories in government by the looks of it in London. Mm, not so good. Waverley Station. But for many commuters the story was Labour losses more than SNP gains. Watching one after the other high profile names go I just I was just shocked. I did not wish the SNP well we will come back Labour will win. Thank you. We also have a train to catch, heading towards Westminster. We need number seven for a majority. Passengers like Stuart and Melanie are stunned. The fella did the exit poll is going to make a fortune. Isn't <laughs> we cross into the northeast of England. It would look like it was going to be so tight, and that just hasn't been the case. I just can't understand where all the, the pundits have been who are saying Labour are going to do well. York. And as we stop at the National Railway Museum, the Tories' victory is becoming clear. 
I'm reasonably happy. But I think it's maybe it's bad for the country that it feels they've like got a majority. I think a co coalition would have maybe been better for the country. 16,000. The Farage moment. I'm surprised. I thought it Barbara was and it. Derek reckon that could be it for UKIP. Without him, I don't think they're going to go very far. There's no one with a voice like him. Lunchtime, we've reached Derby, where one of the city's seats has gone from Labour to Conservative. Voters tell us the economy was the deciding factor. My son, he's a builder, and he's in the last five years, he's never been out of work. Nick Clegg, mm -hmm. Ed Miliband, Nigel Farage have all resigned. Oh, have they? Oh, wow. Not surprising. Not surprising. Not surprising, mate. Why not? Not surprising. They did a good job, did they? I think they've just got to regroup and, and start again, haven't they? London tonight. Soon, 56 Scottish nationalists and hundreds more MPs will travel this route. Our trip is over. A new political journey begins. John Kay, BBC News. The view from voters across the UK there after today's extraordinary result. The time is 21 minutes past six, our top story this evening. David Cameron walks back into number 10 with a Conservative majority on a day of high political drama. And still to come, making plans for Nigel, the UKIP leader resigns but says he may be back after a rest over the summer. Later on BBC London, what now for Boris Johnson? We follow the mayor's progress as he returns to the House of Commons as an MP. And our floating voters give their verdict on today's shock Conservative win. Our election vote sets sail one final time. Today's shock result has claimed the leaders of no fewer than three parties, Ed Miliband, Nick Clegg, and Nigel Farage. In a moment, we'll be hearing from our correspondent Vicky Young on an utterly dismal night for the Liberal Democrats and Alex Forsyth, who's been with UKIP. But first, our correspondent Lucy Manning reports on the resignation of Labour's Ed Miliband. There was much to cry about. Massive losses in Scotland, the lost battle in Tory marginals, the loss of three shadow cabinet members and the lost opportunity to try and form a government. Still, they cheered him in, looking exhausted. But this was far from the victory rally they'd envisaged. I take absolute and total responsibility for the result and our defeat at this election. I'm so sorry for all of those colleagues who lost their seats. So the Ed Miliband era is over. He wanted to move on from New Labour, but it brought only defeat. It was a campaign where Ed Miliband seemed to perform, but his message didn't. Perhaps not left-wing enough for Scotland and too left for the rest of the country. Policies appealing to Labour's core vote, not enough. We have to ask the honest questions and recognise that we won't solve the problem merely by changing the captain on the deck. If the ship's going in the wrong direction, it is up to us to change the direction of the ship. The stumble, perhaps a metaphor for a campaign where voters were unimpressed by his failure to admit Labour spent too much. The Labour Party ends today 100 seats behind the Conservative Party. This is a really big blow for the Labour Party. I think we failed to offer a convincing vision of the future which spoke to the personal aspirations of families up and down Britain. Mr Miliband will now have to find somewhere to put the Ed Stone. A new carving with the worst Labour result since 1987 might be more appropriate. So now Labour must again rebuild. Front runners include Yvette Cooper, whose husband Ed Balls lost his seat, Shadow Health Secretary Andy Burnham, Chucker Amana, Shadow Business Secretary, and former soldier Dan Jarvis. For Ed Miliband, questions about whether he was the right leader, even the right Miliband. But while the voters rejected him, he still has some support. My wife and kids. Five years as leader, six weeks campaigning, one night when Labour was demolished. Lucy Manning, BBC News. Nick Clegg's political rise had been meteoric, leading the Liberal Democrats into government as Deputy Prime Minister after just five years as an MP. 
but rarely has a politician's popularity plummeted so rapidly. By the time he and wife Miriam arrived in Sheffield Hallam in the early hours to hear that he'd won his seat, he already knew dozens of his colleagues hadn't been so lucky. It is now painfully clear that this has been a, a cruel and punishing night for the Liberal Democrats. Five years ago, it was all so different, side by side with David Cameron. <laughs> Mr Clegg was talking about a new kind of politics. In coalition, Lib Dem ministers delivered cherished policies, tax cuts and funding for disadvantaged pupils. But some never forgave them for a U-turn on putting up tuition fees. Today, they've fallen hard, not just the cabinet ministers, but Lib Dem MPs, even in traditional strongholds like the southwest of England, all swept away. So after the highs of government, today party staff faced rejection and despair. Nick Clegg made the controversial decision to take his party into government with the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats have paid a very heavy price. Many say that history will judge his leadership far more kindly than the voters just have, but that is little consolation for the people here today. Despite the pain, colleagues insist Mr Clegg should be proud of what he's achieved. I would like people to reflect on the fact that the man who put the, the national interest first and is, in my view, the decentest man in British politics All right. has now paid the price for that. Nick Clegg has said farewell, but some fear voters' loss of trust in the party for joining forces with the Conservatives may have set the Liberal cause back several decades. The man who promised a political earthquake in the end delivered a tremor. And after failing to win himself a seat in Westminster, Nigel Farage kept his promise and quit as UKIP's leader. But he left the door open for a future return. I intend to take the summer off and there will be a leadership election uh, for the next leader of UKIP in September. And I will consider over the course of this summer whether to put my name forward to do that job again. So there are still questions over his future. I so this is just a summer holiday? Is no, that again for the no, leadership? No, I haven't. So what is this? Is this a resignation or just a short break? I've just resigned as leader of the UK. Yeah. Mr Farage said it was a weight off his shoulders, but admitted professional disappointment at the outcome of the election. 3.9 million people voted for UKIP. It came third in terms of number of votes, but that translated into just one MP and he used his victory speech to say the voting system must change. Approximately four times more people voted either for the Greens or for UKIP than for the SNP, and yet the SNP is expected to get many more times the representation. So do those who supported UKIP agree? Lots of people voted for UKIP, but they've only got one seat I in know, the House. I know, but that's how it happens now. Unless you change the whole system, it's not going to make any difference, is it? Well, the system is broke. It should be proportional representation. Nigel's worked so hard, his team has worked so hard, and nothing. Without the infrastructure of the larger parties, the UKIP campaign had no grand tour or stream of policy announcements. It focused on core messages in key seats, and that didn't win it as many as hoped. So for now, without its frontman, UKIP has to find a way to move on, and some campaign messages have taken on a whole new meaning. Alex Forsyth, BBC News, Thanet. In Wales, Plaid Cymru made no gains, but the Conservatives are celebrating their best election result there for 30 years. One of the seats they took, Gower, had been in Labour hands for more than a century. The results in Northern Ireland leave the Democratic Unionists as the largest party. In a moment, we'll hear from Chris Buckler in Belfast. But first, Howell Griffith on election night in Wales, and the report contains some flash photography. The last time the Tories did this well in Wales, these MPs were still in school. Since 1983, the party's been to electoral oblivion and back here. Now, they're the growing force. Are we going to be sharing an office? <laughs> <laughs> the last time Labour did this badly in Wales, there was a Kinnock in charge. This election has sent another to the Commons, Stephen, son of Neil, and husband to the Danish Prime Minister. Labour is still the largest party here. Wales remains a stronghold. But what this election reveals is the party isn't mobilising its support on the ground, while coming under attack on one side from UKIP and on the other from Ply Cymru. 
The campaign put its leader in the spotlight like never before, winning fans outside of Wales but no new seats within it. People now know what Plaid Cymru stands for and that But they've not voted for it? Well, not yet, perhaps, but uh, next year's Assembly elections I think will be different. Wales may not have seen swings on a Scottish scale, but these results took a shape no one here predicted. The Democratic Unionist Party had positioned themselves as potential kingmakers in this election. In the end, the Conservatives didn't need their support to form a government, but the results confirmed that the DUP would continue their reign as Northern Ireland's biggest party. I think it is very clear that the majority of the Conservative Party is such that there will be occasions in the future uh, where the votes of Democratic Unionist Party uh, will be needed. Of course, electoral success comes at the expense of others. The Cross Community Alliance Party lost its only MP. Despite pressure on the SDLP's leader in South Belfast, the Nationalist Party retained all three of its seats. And having been wiped out in the last parliamentary election, the Ulster Unionists are back at Westminster. One of their two victories was in a constituency which Sinn Féin won by just four votes the last time. And with such a slim majority, the Conservatives at times might look to rely on Unionist support or simply on the fact that Sinn Féin won't take their four seats in the Commons. Well, away from the drama of the election early this afternoon, just yards down that way, senior politicians gathered with veterans of the Second World War to mark the 70th anniversary of VE Day. A two-minute silence was held at the Cenotaph to remember the sacrifices made during the Second World War. James Robbins reports. On an extraordinary day at Westminster, a pause for a national silence. Time to reflect on the terrible cost of victory in Europe over Hitler's Nazis. Prince Andrew laid the first of many wreaths. Watched by more than a hundred veterans, among them Harold Bradley, who fought his way from the D-Day beaches into Germany. When I met him at home in Kent, the gunner from the Royal Artillery told me why it was so important to be at the Cenotaph. That's very easy to answer. To think, one, how lucky I have been, but also to remember those that didn't come back. And, you know, there were one or two that were very close. Six long years. But for most, May the 8th, 70 years ago, was a day for rejoicing. Across Britain, more than a million people took to the streets after Winston Churchill announced war in Europe was finally at an end. Hostilities will end officially at one minute after midnight tonight, Tuesday the 8th of May. We may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing. We may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing. We must now devote all our strength and resources to the completion of our task, both at home and abroad. One veteran who certainly remembers his brief period of rejoicing is Ken Wilkinson, RAF fighter pilot. Now 96, he flew Spitfires, but that May the 8th, 1945, he was up in a hurricane with his radio tuned to the BBC Forces programme. And the news came on that the war was over. VE. And so I did a great big barrel roll around the uh, Wellington bomber, landed back at Honeybourne and went to the nearest boozer that was selling beer and had a few. And over the weekend, many of these veterans will be at the centre of a host of events as remembrance gives way to celebration and thanksgiving. James Robbins, BBC News at the Cenotaph. Time for a look at the weather now. The rain's just about held off here in Downing Street. Here's Alex Deakin.
Thanks, Fiona. Yes, warming up over the next few days, but not necessarily sunny everywhere. A fair bit of rain around tonight, and it will be a damp start tomorrow. But um, stick with it. Brighter skies for many of us, certainly by the afternoon. Outbreaks of rain, no covering Northern Ireland, Northern England, Southern Scotland and Eastern England currently. That does tend to fade that large area of rain through the night. It's quite a blustery night along the south coast. A warmer night than recent nights. Double digits across the south, but clearer skies in northwest Scotland. A touch of frost is possible here. We do start the weekend with some sunshine here, but elsewhere it'll be a grey drab start to Saturday with some outbreaks of rain and drizzle. A few sharp showers drift through southern areas. We'll keep a few showers into the afternoon across the east, but for many it'll brighten up. There'll be some afternoon sunshine. Temperatures getting into the mid-teens for many, maybe 18 or 19 across the southeast. A warm day across central and eastern areas on Sunday with some sunshine here, but further west and further north there will be cloud and outbreaks of rain. Not so warm here, but perhaps turning a bit warmer by Monday, Fiona. Well, that's all from me after a truly extraordinary day that's changed the political landscape. Now we can join the BBC's news teams where you are. Bye-bye. Tonight on BBC London News. Going, going, gone. The Lib Dems are all but wiped out in London, losing some of their longest-serving MPs. Unfortunately, this has been a terrible night for our party all over. Uh, but I can, I'm, I'm absolutely sure that we're going to bounce back both nationally and locally. Taken by the Tories, I'm live in Twickenham, Vince Cable's former constituency, with reaction to one of the shock results of the night. Not before time. I am surprised, I must say, but yeah, yes, I'm sad because he was a very good MP for us. An island of red in a sea of blue, Labour bucks the national trend to increase its London seats. I mean, not very Tory, obviously. But you have what next for Boris Johnson? We follow the mayor's fortunes as he returns to Westminster as an MP. And I'm back on board our BBC London election boat to hear what swung it for our panel of floating voters. Good evening and welcome to a special edition of BBC London News with me, Riz Latif. Here we are overlooking the Houses of Parliament on what's turned into a devastating day for the Liberal Democrats, all but wiped out here in the capital. And while nationally the Tories dominate, in London it's Labour who stole the lead. Our political correspondent Carl Mercer reports now on how the drama unfolded. It wasn't a good night to be a London Lib Dem. Everywhere you looked, they were losing seats, six in all in the capital. After 32 years, the voters of Southwark finally decided they'd had enough of Simon Hughes. And I hope you think, for 32 years, I have served you well. Thank you very much. Ed Davey, Paul Burstow and Vince Cable in south-west London found voters there just as unforgiving. How do the Lib Dems, yourself and the Lib Dems, pick yourself up, though? I mean, across the board, it's going to be a bad night. Oh, you, the party you, and you, yourself. You've worked that one out, have you? It's a bad night, yeah, we've worked that one out. Um, uh, and, um, well, let's reflect. I mean, um, we're all, we are a little shocked because we, our figures were suggesting that we're going to do a lot better. I, it does seem to me that it was a very much a late swing, which the polls hadn't picked up. In fact, no one had picked it up. Tom Brake is now the only Lib Dem MP left in London. Those people will not support a party that has been in, in government, which they now perceive as being an establishment party. So we've got to go back to our grassroots, rely on our local activists, uh, build up from, from the bottom up.